When I was a little girl, I was just an inveterate reader. It became my life very quickly. I think I was in very shy. Don't know why, but I was. I always had an intense group of friends, not a big gang of friends, but actually two girls in my early childhood. And the reading that I did when I was solitary fed into that friendship in that I got them to read the same books and then we played the books. We had games which were based on the books. The very first book I can remember was a picture book about the small family. And it was Papa Small and Mama Small and the Small Smalls. My mother can't remember it. I don't, didn't possess it. I never knew what it was, but this little ordinary family doing ordinary things had seized my imagination. That, that's when I'm three or four, I think. And when I mentioned it recently, actually, in an interview, the editor found it for me. It's, a, it's an American book from the 50s. And now it's obvious to me they're an American family. It didn't occur to me at the time. I didn't wonder why they were all going to church, which we never did. Anyway, it's a, it's a lovely book and it's incredibly ordinary. Mama washes the dishes, Papa goes to work and mends things. But I, th I sort of hold that book responsible for my preference for realism. You know, I don't really want to write about fairy tales and magic and so the supernatural. I actually want to talk about people in there every day. And then after that, it was Swallows and Amazons, which is classic English series of stories about kids who, whose parents let them go off sailing on lakes in the Lake District and they had amazing adventures and they sort of fought a, a pretend war with a couple of girls who also had a yacht. I mean, I'd never sailed. My parents didn't have a yacht <laughs> and et cetera. But my identification with those books was total and passionate and I read them and reread them and reread them. In fact, I've written a short story about how I once dreamed that I was reading the first favorite volume, Swallows and Amazons. And I, in my dream, I came upon an epilogue, an afterword, which told me how they died. It was so, and I woke up from this dream in horror. I can still remember the words that I seemed to read in this imaginary epilogue. Susan lived to a ripe old age, but Roger, the little boy was called Roger actually, met an, met an untimely end in an accident. I mean, where in my psyche did that come from? And it was a horror to me. But again, I can, I can see a child groping for adult things. Anyway, so that, yeah, I was a huge reader. I went to the local library. The school took, my little junior school took us hand, hand in hand, all the whole class down to the library every week. That doesn't happen anymore. And I, th I think we're allowed to borrow, is it three books or five? And I would take them home and read them, bring them all back next week. And that, that was the beginning. That was the beginning of, of living one's life in two worlds. One world, the actual world of, of, of oneself and one's immediate family and friends and the things one needed to do. And the other world of dreaming and escaping into books. I mean, of course, there's, there, there's this second world, the dreaming world, has now become elaborated into a world I'm making up as well as the world I'm reading. I never stop reading. I, those writers who say, oh, when I'm writing a novel, I can't read anything. How could that be? How could you stop? I, I, I have to have a book with me. It's the same, I think, as when I was a child. It's not, it's not enough just to be me somehow. I need to have a bigger space. And then at some point, again in childhood, I wanted to make my own other space. And I did. I wrote lots and lots of things as a child, mostly scraps and bits, unfinished novels, always, you know, copycat, always copying something I'd read. I, I wrote little books at one point and my mum used to sew them together for me and then draw illustrations on the back for me. So I don't have those anymore. It's sad. I don't know where they are anyway. That was lovely. So all, all was writing, but I knew it, even as a child or, you know, maybe perhaps as a 
young teenager. I knew the books weren't quite right. They weren't good, like things I was reading. I can even remember a rather funny thing where I knew that writers did a lot of reworking and correcting. So I can remember writing out lines of some story and then going in and crossing out some of the words, not particularly because they weren't any good, but because I thought that's what real writing was like. So although I wrote stories in my childhood and youth, that was an unsatisfactory experience. Whereas playing the games that were based on the same imaginary world was so thrilling. Me and these other little girls, we had certain games we played over and over. Um, we would say, let's play Mary, Catherine and Lucy was one of them. We used to play that in the school playground. They all had different spaces. And it was about these women who strangely had lots of children and no men, uh, no explanation for that. And they lived on three islands and they, they were all, we were always rowing between the islands and shopping. And th that's the funny thing, of course, is you make your imaginary world and instead of making it a world of mermaids and space travel, you put washing up and children into it, exactly the things that you're then going to do in your real solid grounded life. But it was in the games that the imagination seemed rich and free and truthful with the other people there also taking on those roles and those parts. And it was immensely exciting playing those games, much more exciting than the business of writing stories. Well, inside my writing, I'm, I'm so certain that there's a direct line to be translated from the games through dreaming as a teenager and a young adult, through fantasy and, and imagining into writing. And actually I did used to, I used to fantasize a lot and make up things that could happen with people I knew and situations that could happen and lives I could have. And then when I, found my way in writing and was writing things I was happy with, the fantasizing stopped. And I don't know whether that was because I was in my 40s, maybe it was going to stop anyway, or was it because that same extraordinary surplus part of the mind, which, which is more than our individuality and our immediate experience and which dreams something else, shadow lives, that, that went into writing books. I mean, when I was at university studying literature, I dropped all idea of writing because I was so overwhelmed by the things I loved that I read. But very quickly afterwards, sneaking back came this desire to tell stories on paper, in words. And then I would try and Actually, for, for two long decades, really, well, and, until I was in my 40s, I tried and I wrote and I got more ambitious in my trying. I, I wrote short stories and then I, I wrote novels. And it, it was all a failure. And it's sort of a very horrible at the time because I didn't feel I was very good at anything else. I'd had a brief time as a school teacher, which I was terrible at. Um, I, my heart wasn't in it. My husband was a very good school teacher and it was everything to him. And I just knew I was too selfish, too lazy, too anguished by, by the children. Oh, turning off the lights in the dark drama studio and me shouting at them into the darkness. What, what a nightmare. So I felt I would never be able to do anything except well, maybe this thing of writing was what I wanted to do, but I couldn't do that either. So f I struggled, struggled. And I think I was just, I was very impressionable rather than forceful. I was soaking everything up, but I didn't know how to push it out. I didn't know how to be strong. Then I came, I mean, I would be trying to give up writing all the time because I was failing and it was horrible and you know I was having a I was having a real full life at the same time don't get me wrong I have my children lovely friends parties stuff life but always this this nagging sense that nothing was quite good enough unless I could represent it which again is very strange why would I say that I love paintings but I have no need to paint things 
I love films, but have no need to make films of things. But I had this need to make writing. Uh, so I was failing and I thought, well, two things. I will do a creative writing course, which they were just starting to, to be, there were starting to be more of them in the UK. And I was very contemptuous and I thought, no writer I admire has ever been on a creative writing course. What is this silly thing? But I better do something, test it, see, either just stop once and for all or, or what. Anyway, so I did take a creative writing course and it was marvelous actually. Nobody can teach you to write, but to be sort of out of the closet, to be not just alone in one's attic, but with other people who were writing, working, and and to kind of lose inhibition about just um, doing it, reading it, um, showing it to people. And then the sense of audience pushing back at you. I think that's almost the most important thing you can get from a course. You're writing not for Tolstoy, but for Ron and Debbie on Thursday. And you think, this is boring for them. This isn't good enough. What he did was good last week. I, I want to do better than that. So it, it raises your game and concentrates it. And I think that audience, the sense of an audience was very useful. But anyway, still the novel I wrote on that course didn't get published and I'm also, it, it was a mess. It was a hybrid book. Bits of it were okay and bits weren't. And I thought, if I go on failing like this, I'm going to have such an unhappy, silly life. You know, I, I have to do something I'll, I could, I'll be good at. And I thought, well, it's much easier being a critic than being a writer. And I've always been relaxed as a critic. I'm very confident about what I like and why. And so I did a PhD in literature and then published that as a book on Henry James. I had to think very hard, which writer am I still going to love after three years of writing about him? And I decided it was James and it was true, I was right, it worked. And uh, I now think, I had no idea of this at the time, but I now think that the, the, the authority that I wrote into those sentences as I worked on my James book, and thought about what I thought about those novels and put it into words and pushed at the words and tried to express the whole of what I could perceive. I think that rehearsed a new kind of authority in me, which without my knowing it, then seeped across into the creative work that I was still doing. I was still writing short stories and I then began to write my first novel that got published, which really is a collection of linked short stories. And I think the same positioning in relation to what am I going to say? What do I think? Where am I in that thinking? That then gave me, I suppose, what's carelessly all over the place called a voice. I found a voice. I did. You know, I only tend to write about things within my lifetime. I've maybe written two stories, I think, that are from the 1910s and the 1920s, and short stories, and I, I can't imagine myself embarking on a novel set in the past. I don't know how that's done, because it seems to me so difficult to capture the idiom of an era. When, I, when I've written Free Love set in the 60s, well, I was a child then. So in some ways, a child's memories are perfect for writing a novel, even when it's not about children very much. Because what you remember as a child are the smells, the tastes, the colours, the appearances, the solidity of things, which is exactly what you need as a sort of ground base for your story. And then, of course, I'm you know, I'm aware of our past in the UK, so I have a very strong sense of what a social type like my characters would have done and been, you know, what, how they would have interacted, a sort of anthropologist sense, if you like. I love to think about novelist work as a little bit like a kind of anthropology. I, I can also ask my parents it's easy to find stuff on the internet when you just want to check what, what cars were there, 
how many people owned cars then, you know, but actually lots of that, it is in you. And my brother always says, how can you remember everything? How can you remember? And I say, I don't remember any more than you. It, the business of the writer is, you don't really don't have to have a great memory. You have to have the bits of memory you do have, and then it's putting them into the sentences that's your specialism. I really don't think I have an especially good memory, but everybody has this store of pictures, smells, sounds, and, and perceptions of class, character, um, danger, all, all of that stuff is in there, and it's a matter of accessing it and choosing the right bits. However, I think the hardest thing when writing about the 60s, for instance, which 70s was easy because I was there, but you, you ask yourself, what, what did people say? How did they speak? What was the idiom? If I ever was going to write something set in 1850, I think that would seem an insuperable challenge. But in the 1960s, I mean, I did... It, a book fell into my hands. A friend just lightly and carelessly said, oh, have you read Jonathan Green's um, A Day in the Life? It was a book serendipitously published by my lovely publisher at Cape, but much, much earlier. It was a book written in the 80s about the 60s, and it was simply lots of interviews with everybody who was there in the counterculture in London at that time. Sort of some of them extremely ironic, some of them thinking it was the best time ever. And there was all the idiom, all the sampling of words that I needed. And some of the most extreme things that I used in my book, like people thinking, oh, if only all the governments of the world would drop acid together, we could have world peace. They are not made up. You know, they sound like a parody, but they come straight from the book. So, so uh, there's, it's, I can remember myself reading other writers and thinking, I'll never be able to do that because I don't know all those things. But all you have to do is find the right channel for the stuff you do know. That's, that's the secret. It isn't. Writers don't actually know much more than anybody else. If you merely constructed a past out of the sort of high cultural markers, which it's fun to do, like Trish Tropic. And I discussed with my husband for a while which other books, I mentioned a few other books later that were classics of the time. Um, it, there would be something too arid about that. You've, you've also got to go down in the roots of things, you know, sort of beneath the culture, if you like. And yet at the same time, I, I think the smells... And this is a slightly disgusting reminiscence, but somebody pointed out to me that I often mention dog shit in my books. And actually, I can remember in my childhood, it was so inoffensive because, although it wasn't very nice, but dogs ate bones. And it was it was sort of little. You really don't want this on your recording, do you? Me describing dog poo. Yeah. <laughs> in the olden days, the dogs dog poo used to just be little calcinated, innocent-looking white. Now they eat these tins of dog meat, and it's like human poo. I mean, thank goodness we people pick it up now and put it in bins, but still. Anyway, that, that was an unwanted digression into a sordid area. But I do think the, the visceral sense of a place and a time is if that isn't in the book the book is only half alive so that needs to be in there too and I, I actually do think I have quite a alert sense of smell I'll always be saying something smells funny in this house and my husband's looking at me blankly and saying really it smells fine to me so yes so I'm reading from the very last pages, reading the very last pages of Free Love. Roger drove up to Cressing one weekend. The road ran for a while alongside a high brick wall which marked the boundary of the estate. He pulled in beside a pair of black iron gates, then got out of the car to look through them at the drive which was overgrown with burdock and thistle. Jean had warned him that these gates were kept padlocked. The stately great trees inside the park were mostly bare and leaves lay thick on the ground in their hectic colour. Pale grass had grown waist high in places or lay flattened and dirty where the wind had broken it. Water glinted like a reminder from between the trees there was a small ornamental lake. 
This landscape designed for the human eye seemed withdrawn and secretive, as if it had attained to a life all its own and didn't want any longer to be viewed. He thought that he shouldn't have come. It was too late. Further along the road, he turned into the rough track Jean had described, which ran past the ruined greenhouses and kitchen garden, then emerged from behind the shrubbery. Abruptly, the house loomed overhead, filling up his view, its facade stuccoed greenish-white, the grey stone of the rear quarter stained with damp, and the gothicy narrow windows inhospitable, though a pallid electric light gleamed behind one or two of them. The track crossed the moat, which was empty, and ran up to a side entrance. As his engine died, Jean came out of the door in a plastic Mac and Wellington boots, scarf tied under her chin. It was as if she'd deliberately chosen to look, what was the word Phyllis had used? Frumpy. A muddy cocker spaniel bounced around her knees. Go down, Flossie, down, bad girl. Roger knew that she let the dog distract her because it was too much for her to see him there. She didn't know how to greet him. It's awful inside the house, she said, pulling at Flossie's ears, laughing like an awkward schoolgirl glancing at him sideways. I dread you seeing how the place has deteriorated. Let's go for a walk instead. Oh dear, are those your only shoes? But he had brought walking boots and a stout stick. Everything was better once they set out. Jean was less self-conscious, and her pace was a good match for his. She swung her walking stick. The path led down at first and skirted the lake where Flossie splashed into the water among the reeds, barking at ducks, the fur on her belly draggled with wet silt afterwards. Then they went up towards the woods patched with ragged, vivid colour, scribbled over with the wet ink black of twigs and branches. Roger and Jean's talk as they climbed was desultory, only skimming the top of the afternoon. The sound of their steps, crackling cobnuts and beech nuts underfoot, expressed their closeness better than anything they said. Do you remember this? Jean exclaimed at last, throwing out her hand at the view when they got to the top. The truth, however, was that he didn't remember it. Roger might almost have believed he'd never visited here before. It was not that the reality of it was disappointing, but his store of treasured old images turned out to be shrunken and limited beside the confounding actuality of the place, so messy and unfinished and complicated. Nothing was where he'd remembered it, and he had no recollection of this walk. At the top of the hill, a wooden seat was put almost too obviously in the spot where they were bound to sit down to rest, looking back at the house, which was not desolate from this distance. Against its backdrop of more trees, it looked like something out of a fairy tale with its turret and its slate roofs shining like silver, its golden cockerel weather vane blowing this way and that over the stables. Roger remarked that he'd never been up in the observatory. Golly, neither have I, Jean said, or not for hundreds of years anyway since I was a girl. We should go up. I'll bet Mrs Chick knows where the keys are. It wasn't a real observatory, she warned him. Just a little round room in the tower at the top of the house with a brass telescope and a truckle bed. A conical roof could be up unbolted to open partially to the sky, trundling round on a rusted mechanism of wheels and cogs. The old gentleman who built Cressing had spent his nights alone up there. When I retire, Roger said, I'll come here to live with you and watch the stars. Surprised by joy, she turned to smile into his smile. But darling, I'll be long dead by the time you retire. And anyway, there's never enough money to keep this place up. Peter would cut me off if you were here. Roger put his arm around her shoulders, pulled her close against him on the seat. In their bulky coats with scarves and gloves, they were only aware indistinctly of each other's shape under the padding. Then leave it. Come and live with me now in Ottilie. He knew that he would need someone. He couldn't. 
He shouldn't carry on for too long, deep buried in his home alone. Are you serious? Are you serious, really, even with the whole thing with Nicholas? He hesitated and then said that he was serious, but Jean had registered his hesitation. I can't imagine myself in Ottilie, she said. No, he admitted, resigned. I can't imagine you there either. It's too small. Then where can we go? He thought about it. I could hand in my notice and you could sell this place or just shut it up. We could buy somewhere very cheaply in Italy, open it for paying guests, or in Morocco or Tunisia, where at least I can speak the language. We'd have to be able to pay for Hugh's education and give something to Nicholas, perhaps to Phyllis. Meanwhile, we'd be out of the way, not drawing anyone's attention. No one would notice us. So, would you come in with me? Jean allowed herself to imagine it for a moment. Mrs Chick would agree to have Flossie. And all those plates and knives and forks could turn out to be useful after all. And the quantities of monogrammed linen bedsheets and pillowcases. Perhaps even the chafing dishes and wine coolers. In a brief absence that was like a hallucination, she seemed to see... In place of the mossy, frowsty, damp, disintegrating English autumn scene around them. A stone well in an ancient paved courtyard, baked in glancing white light. A bucket hit the surface of water far below with a muffled smack, and she knew that the well water was pure and cold and good. But then... On the other hand, she was 60 years old and Roger had his brilliant career at the Foreign Office. It was too late. A fitful wind drove the torn clouds, sent leaves scudding and skipping on the path. Squawking rooks warning off a marauding peregrine were flung against the sky, giving themselves to the wind like scraps of black paper. She squeezed his hand through the thick fabric of their gloves, promised him that she would think about it.